day for reflecting, observing, witnessing yourself or the conditions that you're experiencing in consciousness. And then the attitude of the the knower, the watcher, the observer, the witness, rather than the personality that feels this way or feels that way. Of course, it takes a while to really uh, develop this practice, but the the aim is to... um, find the, the way out of suffering or the way of non-suffering. And uh, the quote that I chanted, Aparuta de Sangamatasatavaraza, after the Buddha's enlightenment, he announced that the gates to the deathless are open. Aparuta de Sangamatasatavara. Amatasatavara is... Uh, Gates to the deathless. And then, Ye Soda one Taba Munchan Tu Satang, those who listen, those who hear, those who are alert and attentive, uh, trust, release your faith, or live in this knowledge of awareness. So, the important thing is to is to recognize and develop awareness. And as I was saying this morning, that we tend to think of enlightenment or the or nibbana or nirvana something extreme, uh, because uh, language itself tends to make it seem like that. So we say nirvana is the highest happiness. That makes it sound like some kind of extreme, uh, ultra-refined kind of happiness. Enlightenment sounds, you know, like some magnificent experience where you, and in the scriptures that speak about, you know, the, the earth shook and trembled, the universe quivered to its, and so forth, as if, you know, this is what you know, what we, we hope to expect when we experience enlightenment. Uh, and these are, these are kind of, this is kind of hyperbole that religious scriptures oftentimes use. So the, recognize that the limitation of language is that uh, language is a dualistic function of the mind. Thinking yeah. You can't think yourself into enlightenment. You know, it's not, it's not something that I can actually uh, define for you and, and, and then you know what it is. <clears throat> thinking, just, just contemplating the, the thinking process. One thought follows another, isn't it? That's just the way it is. So you have these, one, one thought will connect to another. So a thought moment, you can only have one thought moment at a time because you can't think uh, two thoughts at the same moment. So thought thinking is, is a time-bound condition. It's, a, it's an artifice that we've created. Uh, it's dualistic. When we say dualistic, it means that it, if you have right, you've got to have wrong, good, you have bad, day and night and heaven and hell. When we talk about death and the deathless, this is, these are still words, aren't they? This is language. Death and the deathless. But notice when we, we're talking about, when we have to use words like deathless or unconditioned Unborn, you say, when we talk about what is conditioned, born, created, formed, and then the the opposite is unconditioned, uncreated, unborn, unformed. There's a negation.
So language, recognize that, that language is useful and, it's, uh, and it can be used skillfully, or uh, so many of us have been obsessed with our own thoughts. Just the, the, the way, the, the thinking habits we develop, where we're just caught in, a, in the endless cycle, in a vortex of our own thinking that goes on and on and on. It doesn't seem to ever stop. I remember the first few years of my monastic life, my thinking mind just wouldn't stop. Just go on and on and on. And I used to pray that I'd stop thinking. <laughs> because it was, because you get so tired of it. And, and especially you're repeating the same things over and over. When you're living monastic life, you know, you can only think so much and then you start <laughs> repeating it all over again. <laughs> but we can listen to ourselves think, you see, so, you know, this is, we're not, th- we're not thoughts, and yet we create ourselves, uh, our, our personalities, we identify, we have concepts and uh, definitions and evaluations, good, bad, right and wrong, that we apply to ourselves. And so we, we tend to describe ourselves, define ourselves, analyze ourselves endlessly. Because this is how we're conditioned, our culture is like this. It's a culture that is uh, based on ideals, on what should be and what shouldn't be, on heaven and hell, right and wrong, true and false, good and bad. And so that's uh, the, the kind of cultural conditioning that, that we've acquired. We don't, we don't have, our culture doesn't really provide the deathless, the gate to the deathless as a concept. I didn't come across that till I uh, discovered Buddhism. Well, we talk about immortality, but that's more, uh, the word immortal oftentimes applies to Greek gods, like Apollo and, and uh, Zeus. <laughs> And they're, they're like they're almost you know human-like gods, but they they're immortal; they don't die. But that's another ideal. You know, we can create that the ideal of deathlessness. But what when we talk about the deathless in Buddhism, we're not. It's not a concept that we're supposed to believe in, or or grasp, but to recognize and realize the deathless, the reality of deathless, the reality of the unconditioned, the reality of the unborn, and try to figure that one out. Think about it. Try to, try to think about what unconditioned could be. And you end up with a zero, maybe. It's about the best you can sum up, isn't it? A zero or an, you know, Theravada Buddhism, if you, if you just take it on an intellectual level, it, it sounds very nihilistic, annihilationist. When you say Nibbana is extinction and, uh, you know, there's no soul, no God, no self uh, and enlightenment is, <coughs> is extinction. Well, when you try to figure out, you know, because of the, 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 just the limitation of language and the approach that the Buddha used was almost the opposite of a theistic structure for religion. Say, in a theistic religions, you start from the top, you think, there is God, or I believe in God. So you're starting out the top, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and the, the metaphysical and, and the metaphysical dogmas or doctrines and the rest flow from that. And the Buddha established um, 
Buddhism on not on a, a metaphysical dogma or doctrine, but on an existential reality that is uh, suffering. So it's, it, it, uh, in terms of con- conceptualization, it's the opposite of the of the metaphysical doctrine. Now it's interesting, isn't it, to 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 contemplate this because suffering is is isn't you know God can be very inspiring concept, metaphysical concept about ultimate love and and all the rest that goes along with that, and then but then the existential reality of suffering can be quite depressing if you grasp it. But recognize that a noble truth is not a, a, is not a metaphysical dogma. It's not propounding that, that or proposing that, that there everything is suffering. It's not a kind of just a, a dismal kind of wet blanket that you apply to life, depressing way of looking at everything, which some people do. Everything suffering and permanent is all worthless and it's a sour grapes kind of uh, attitude (laughs) and it is depressing if you keep following that for very long you'll get very depressed so the Buddha isn't making a a doctrinal statement about suffering but he's making uh, a statement that there is suffering he didn't say everything is suffering. He said there is dukkha, and then uh, put it in this context of a noble truth to be understood, to be reflected upon, to be recognized, to be seen for yourself. So the direction is different, say, from just trying to get rid of suffering towards understanding it. To understand something, you have to receive it. To understand yourself, you have to accept yourself as you are. Or if you want to really understand somebody else, you have to accept them as they are. Or anything, to really understand anything at all, uh, you know, you have to, you know, to really understand, you need to receive that as it is, without conditions, you know, of, of... what you would like it to be or what you think it should be. Because understanding means it's like standing under or receiving something. You have to really receive it, even if it is uh, unpleasant or bad or painful or dirty or whatever. To really understand it, you have to accept it as it is. Which does not mean approving. It doesn't mean liking or approving at all. That's something else. <clears throat> so this, but then the, the Buddha's teaching of suffering takes you to the deathless, which is a reality, but it's not, it's not meant to be a metaphysical kind of abstraction or a doctrine. And, and so this is one of the frustrating people frustrations people have with Buddhism in the Western world because they see religion always coming from metaphysical doctrine and and therefore because Buddhism doesn't do that then they even accuse Buddhists of not of it not even being a religion but a religion its purpose is to point to to connect you to direct you to bind you to a convention that takes you to the deathless or ultimate truth, ultimate reality. You can put it in terms of, of God if you want, or these are, these are various words, aren't they? Concepts. The deathless, God tends to be uh, personified, though, so, isn't it? We have, we have anthropomorphic, we have a God as a the kind of patriarchal figure in uh, Judaism and Christianity. 
But in in uh, Buddha Dhamma, then God is not is not uh, is is not personified. You can't make a Dhamma rupa in a human form. You make a Buddha rupa, but not a Dhamma rupa. You usually you use a a wheel. No, you use a Dhamma jaka or the wheel as a symbol for a Dhamma. So in this way, you're getting beyond the the. Um, you don't. You don't. You aren't anthropomorphizing anything. Not, but you're recognizing or realizing the deathless. It's real. It's not. It's not just an abstract idea or concept. So the reality of the deathless is through awareness. Very simple, very direct. But when you try to think of it, you only go into doubt. Awareness. I don't notice anything deathless. (laughs) It's got to be more than that. (laughs) That's too easy. And it is simple. It's very simple, but it's not easy because we're not easy, are we? We're complicated creatures. We complicate everything. <laughs> because we think and we, with our thoughts, we, we become very clever and reasonable and intelligent and, and skilled at so many things through thinking, but, but in the process we become very complicated. And we create endless problems, doubts, and fears, and uh, conditions that that we cling to and identify with. So we become very neurotic, out of touch with the natural energies of our even our own bodies, and that we can be totally disconnected from our bodies sometimes. You know, up in their head, as they say, living in a world, you know that is is uh, mental and and uh, resisting any any kind of recognition of of the body until it it kind of screams and makes endless demands through creating all kinds of pain and illness then we kind of got to pay attention to it then we usually want to go to a doctor and say how can i get rid of this this pain or this disease because i don't I don't like to be bothered with this body at all. I want to go back to my dream world. <laughs> I can't quite sustain the dream if my body is so miserable. <laughs> so in, in awareness, then, we're including the body. Notice that the deathless, the, the Dhamma, ultimate truth, isn't, isn't a kind of... Uh, against the body. We're not trying to despise it or negate it or even criticize the body, but to be aware of it. Use the body. Use this physical body sitting here right now for awareness. So it's the part of the path, isn't it? The body needs to be recognized and received for what it is, the way it is. And of course, the human body, as you very well know, sitting here today, is is a very irritating condition to live with. <laughs> I often thought, you know, from the day I was born, I've been in this constant state of irritation because of this body. <laughs> and that's not a complaint or... Uh, about the body, but it's just recognizing that uh, having a physical body, a human body in this realm, this planet that we live on, the sense realm that we're experiencing right now is, is the experience of being constantly, unrelentingly irritated. (laughs) And it's not personal, don't think it's just you. It's all of us. It's just the way it is. Now, as I said before, it's not a complaint. Just noticing 
that having a physical body is. It's an experience of sensitivity. It's a sensitive form. This is a sense realm. Sense, sensitivity, sensuality, all this conveys this dualism of pleasure-pain, doesn't it? Of beautiful, ugly, pleasant, unpleasant, and uh, sweet and bitter, melodious and cacophonous, and through the senses uh, that we have, through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, through the body, we are in it, things that impinge on these senses we experience. And we, we don't have that much control over what is going to contact this body, do we? It's not that we can just live in a, in, in a, a special situation where only the beautiful and the pleasant impinge on us. Because the body itself is, is total sensitivity. You know, it's a sensitive form, completely sensitive. So, and this, of course, means that it's being continually irritated. So our relationship then to, to the sense world, is, instead of trying to just kind of uh, drown ourselves or drug ourselves into a state where we don't feel anything, we're actually in meditation opening to feeling. Instead of trying to stop it and get rid of it and control it or deny it, we're actually learning from it to understand Vedana, feeling, sensitivity, the body. And so this means that that this is the path, being a human being, having a human body, having the senses and so forth. If we see these in terms of what they are, in terms of Dhamma, then they're actually, everything's taking us to, leading toward, inclining to, enlightenment, to Nibbana, to the deathless. So don't think of anything, every, any thought, any feeling, no matter how refined or how coarse or how good or how bad, all of it, when you're willing to receive it, recognize it and not judge it or criticize it but see it in terms of Dhamma what arises ceases or we say all conditions are impermanent this anicca the only way we can ever do this then is through awareness and awareness itself is the, that's the, that's the gate, that's the door, that's the, that's the opportunity we have uh, within this uh, human form, in this sense realm, to not create suffering, to be liberated from delusion. And when you contemplate this, that's the only possibility. It's not through refinement, is it? It's not through refining, uh, trying to create, uh, uh, you know, control a situation to where only the, the, the ultimate refined uh, possibilities are, are our experience. If we get too refined, then we, we even suffer more, isn't it? People, terribly refined people suffer around ordinary things. <laughs> so then the deathless is ordinary rather than some high state. The deathless or Nibbana, it's ordinary. Now this is, this is a contemplation. I'm not asking you to to believe what I'm saying. This is for reflection. Ordinary means it's here and now. It's so ordinary you don't even notice it. You notice, you tend to pay all atten- to the attention of extremity, don't you? Of pain or 
your thoughts and your, you know, your fears or your anger or your confusion or doubts. And pay attention to, you know, anything that, you know, uh, through what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, think, and so forth. These are always moving towards extremity. And what's ordinary tends to be unnoticed, unrecognized, because we're conditioned to seek extremes and to seek happiness. And happiness in this sense is an extremity, the opposite of suffering. So, say, modern materialism, the American dream, isn't it, to, to write to happiness. We should be happy all the time. We've got a right to it one of the American rights. <laughs> and we suffer a lot because, it, you know, complain a lot because it's our right and we're not happy. <laughs> and we blame it on the government. Or <laughs> so ordinariness then is a uh, is uh, like the Ajahn Chah would always talk about ordinary, the ordinary. And in Thai, Thai language, uh, Dhamma, the word Dhamma is, uh, is the word for nature. And they talk about nature like trees and mountains and so forth, you call it Dhamma, dhamma Cha. And so it's a, you have the word Dhamma in it. And then ordinary, Ordinary is tamada, which means, you know, using the word tamma. Tamada meaning ordinary. Not extreme, nothing special. So ordinariness is, uh, is quite, quite difficult for us to accept because our personalities are usually based on some extreme. And then our desires, isn't it? Our identity and obsessions with wanting and not wanting take us to extremities. Wanting happiness, wanting success, wanting to be loved, wanting to feel secure, wanting to be accepted, wanting to win the prize, be the winner, be the champion. And those are all extremes. And then wanting, always wanting to be the winner means that we, we have to live in fear of being a failure, isn't it? The, being a failure, we dread being poverty-stricken, a failure, homeless, rejected, unloved, sick, uh, despised by others. And we dread that. And those are extremes, isn't it? Those are the extremities that we create with thought. So what's ordinary right now, say, that isn't depending on, on uh, isn't, isn't a quality that we can recognize. It's not like uh, yellow or blue or anything like that. It's not pretty or ugly. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, we have no way of expressing neutrality except for us, oftentimes, we just consider it kind of a mediocre compromise, a kind of tasteless porridge or dreariness. But what is really ordinary is a deathless, because it's here and now, we say the Dhamma, apparent here and now, Santiti called Dhamma, apparent here and now. It's here and now. It's not, you know, whatever you are, if you're going to the toilet, it's here and now. It's not, it's not dependent on being in the shrine room. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you're doing, whatever, <laughs> it's not a place, is it? not dependent on conditions being, being uh, a certain way. 
apparent here and now, timeless, akalika dhamma, you say, akaliko, timeless. Timeless. What is that? Because time to us is real. And the, the, our culture is very much bound to time as our reality. You know, we, we identify strongly with our age, the age of our bodies, and, and the memories we have of the past and our plans for the future. The future, sometimes when you're young, you live for the future. And at least I did. It was all, everything was going to happen in the future. When you're my age, the future is increasing senility (laughs) and death. Which is, you know, is, is rather dreadful in a way, isn't it? If you, <laughs> if you, if you're caught in, in identi- identifying with it. So, santitiko uh, akaliko dhamma. These these words, uh, we chant this every morning. Santitiko akaliko ehi pasko opanaiko vajatang. We teed up what we knew and we thought the, the, the Dhamma. Ehi Pasiko Dhamma is, uh, as it's translated in English, it doesn't have the same punch that it has in Pali. It's an encouraging investigation, just doesn't do the job. <laughs> it's more like. Uh, an invitation, ehi pasiko, come and see right now, look, wake up. Ehi pasiko is, is, is like now, you know. Not the, I want to encourage you to investigate now. <laughs> Upanaika Dhamma, uh, in leading, in, in the England they, they translate leading onwards, and here I notice it's leading inwards. But it's leading, anyway. How <laughs> <laughs> we don't go onwards or inwards, but <laughs> once you, once you, once you recognize Dhamma, then, it, you know, it leads, it, you, you, you begin to rest in it, you, you, Surrender to it. You be, you are that Dhamma rather than this mortal creature, this personality, this frail body, and so forth that you think you are. <clears throat> you find uh, your refuge, your your true nature in the deathless, not in the physical body you have or any ideas, concepts emotions, uh, memories, or whatever that, that you might uh, be experiencing. And budgetang me tida po nui is a, budgetang is like, you have to know it for yourself. Ehi particles, come and see, you know. Feel it, know it, recognize it for yourself. It's not just to believe it because somebody tells you about it, or because you think you're a Buddhist, so you have to believe in in the deathless Dhamma. That, that's no refuge, you know, just believing in the ideas, but in seeing it for yourself, like tasting honey, isn't it? Once you taste honey, you know what honey's like. And if you've never tasted honey, then you, you people tell you what it's like, but you don't really know. So it's like, it's sweet like sugar. Sweet like sugar. <laughs> but you don't really know. But as soon as you taste it, then you know for yourself. That's like budgetang. You taste the Dhamma, you know, and because you, and no matter what anybody tells you, you know, and once you've tasted honey, you know, people can say, honey um, tastes like broccoli, and you know they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> but if you've never tasted any, you might think, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Tastes like broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> So this deathlessness in my own practice, it's always fascinated me. Uh, this is what really, uh, you know, has been my, my kind of um, sole aim in, in, in these years of practice. Because intuitively I, I can sense that, that yet the the, the, the habits uh, the, of thinking, conceptualizing, and, and the inevitable, inevitable doubts that come from being attached to thinking and reading and, and listening to others and so forth and getting caught up in doubts and confusion or intimidations or whatever through the thought process. So the aim early on in practice, was to stop thinking. Now, how do you do that? And that was, uh, that was, you know, an insight I had when I was a Samanera, before I met Ajahn Chah. How to stop thinking. And I kept thinking about how to stop thinking. <laughs> and so you end up, you, think, you know, getting nowhere. Because it to stop th- and just to to kind of willfully stop thinking doesn't work. I mean, you can kind of stop it, but it kind of rebounds back very quickly. You can't sustain it just to repressing th- thoughts. So then, then of course, the only way is awakening, awakening, paying attention, sati sampatanya. And so that means listening. To me, that signifies listening. Because I can listen to myself thinking. So I'm, I use this as a skillful means, listening to myself thinking. Now, and to do this, then I had to deliberately think, you know, because if I, you know, but listen with the intention of listening. So I say, I am... Uh, sumato bhikkhu, and, and I be, and I listen to myself thinking that. Where if I was just trying to stop, I mean, there is no sumato bhikkhu, everything is anatta, and, and I, how can I stop thinking by trying to repress it? I get nowhere. Because I'm still clinging to the ideas of not thinking and no self. And, and it doesn't work. You can't. You're just clinging to to a negation. But if you're going to cling, it's better to cling to a positive thing like all is love and God loves me and things like this. At least clinging to that will probably make you, give you some moments of happiness. But clinging to the idea of I, there's no self and no soul doesn't make you happy. But listening to thinking, that is, that means you're, you know, you're paying attention to listen to yourself thinking. You know, you're, uh, you pay attention to the thought process that you're creating. And by doing that, then I could really, uh, I began to get perspective. That which is aware and listening is not thought. And uh, well, as I paid attention to myself intentionally thinking, I began to notice when there was no thought. When the mind stops thinking, when the thinking process packs up. In England, uh, the best way to get English people to stop thinking is to say, are there any questions? <laughs> Uh, 
and the whole room stops thinking at that moment. <laughs> but they don't notice it. So like, like in uh, notice it, the non-thinking, because it's not that we think all the time, but we're not conscious of, we're not using our consciousness to notice when there's no thought. So in the gaps between thought, like I am Sumato Bhikkhu, before I even think I, there's a blank there. That's an empty space. No thought. And then I, deliberately thinking I, and then there's an empty space. Now we don't notice that when we're just caught up in thinking, I'm Ajahn Sumedho, I'm Ajahn Sumedho. <laughs> and then it goes on and I'm, uh, you know, I can talk about myself and give you my whole life history uh, and, be, and not notice any gaps or points in between the words. But, you know, just get, rattle on and on. Till I, till I get tired, or you get tired and leave. <laughs> so, this is to deliberately notice this space. The, the intuitive intelligence isn't a, it doesn't depend on thought. So just by making, being more conscious, this consciousness then you connect, the Sati Sampachanya allows a connected awareness in consciousness. You know, so it's not just fragmentary or, or, or just flashes of, of this or that. But you, and you have a sustained attentiveness with consciousness to recognize the presence and absence of a thought or a concept or a memory. So this is a way of exploring, investigating your own, you know, your conscious experience and your mind, your, your, the mental uh, habits that you have, the good ones, bad ones, whatever. It's not, not a point of, of uh, you know, just trying to 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 have a, you know, a good experience, but it's also putting into perspective what you call your dark side or your shadow side or the, the negative side too, because all conditions are impermanent, and that means the good ones and the bad ones, and the neutral ones. <clears throat> so this is the, the, the gate to the deathless, the this awareness, sati sampatanya in Pali, Pali language, intuitive awareness. I use this the title of a of a book, intuitive awareness. I like the word intuition because it implies an intuitive moment is isn't a thought moment. It's not. In, it's it's more of like a, a a receptive moment to this moment now the way it is, receiving this moment without uh, you know judging it or 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 dividing it in any way. So it's a different you know different experience for us when we're when we develop intuitive awareness than when we're just caught in our intellectual habit. Because uh, intuitive awareness then is, 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 is not developed in the Western world very much. And we're not, we usually regard intuition as, as, a, as something not trustworthy, not highly regarded in, in the West usually. So it can be sus suspect, you know, you can't trust it, but you want proof, you want facts, you want uh, things tested out scientifically, DNA and everything else, you know, uh, proven uh, to the letter of the law, and then we'll believe it. But in intuition, what's that? 
sounds pretty, uh, you know, untrustworthy. Can you trust a, an intuitive person? No. But a very rational, common sense, reasonable person, oh yes, yes. <laughs> They have a PhD in nuclear physics. You can trust them. <laughs> so intuition is is uh, you know has been ignored almost in Western society, but it's still very much. Without that, we would you know we would we would not be you know if we were just rational creatures. We would be like reptiles. You know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't feel anything. You can rationalize anything, rationalize genocide. You can justify any kind of thing with your uh, intellect if you want. You know, torture. Uh, you know, the question of, is it, is it right to use torture uh, with terrorists? And you can present a very rational case in support of this, you know, very reasonable. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons to torture terrorists or people that are called terrorists. <laughs> Be, and, and rationally, you know, we can justify anything, actually, anything we want to do. Because rationality is a valuable function, but it is an unfeeling function. People that depend on the rational mind oftentimes don't feel life. You may have noticed. They don't. They they tend to live in in the realm of ideals uh, and concepts, and which don't feel anything. There's concepts, ideals have no feeling. They're not. They have no vedana. But in, in our conscious experience, we have, we're, we're in a feeling realm, a sensitive realm. So Vedana is very powerful in our lives. We feel things. We feel heat or cold. We feel, when just the word uh, torture, isn't it? Taking just the English word torture. And we, when I hear that word, I get a kind of sick feeling. When somebody says, it's, it's all right to torture the enemy. You know, I can, I can, I can rationalize and, and, and justify torture through the rationale, but when I really look at what I'm feeling, I can't. You know, intuitively, I, I, can't, I can't really, uh, uh, you know, I feel... I feel Sickened by it, torture, the it, deliberate intent to harm and uh, exploit somebody, some other creature in some very painful way, break them down, humiliate them, destroy them in some way. To me, that is is you know just uh, on a level of intuition. And, and sense of moral propriety, I can't support it. But I could support it in terms of national security. <laughs> uh, so this is, I'm just talking about myself, not talking about anyone else. So I'm just pointing out how, you know, how, just so you become aware of of what the equipment that you have, the way you, a human being really is. Because when we live in a world of ideals and ideas, rational thoughts, and a, this, is, this has a great value, admittedly, but as a refuge, it tends to cut us off. It makes us unfeeling and insensitive. So we can say, you know, well, genocide, well, you know, sometimes it is all right, you know, the population, the world, there's so many people in it, and, and, uh, <laughs> you know, we can, you know, we can have, uh, 
what is it where they you want to to rid the world of any uh, inferior strains <laughs> and eugenics and whatnot you know so you you can you can present a rational case for this but feeling then is is like this and 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 feeling is is what you know if we if we lose our feeling if we don't open to feeling to sensitivity then then we can be monsters we can be cold hearted uh scientists that that can just abuse anything for the sake of scientific advancement and and discovery so in in buddhist meditation you know so much of the uh, practice really is being aware of feeling of pleasure pain heat and cold of of how things impinge on our consciousness and how we create suffering around that impingement so in 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 reflecting in this way we begin to see that we create suffering like like the actual being human born as a, in a human form in the sense realm this as i said before is is all about birth and death and sensitivity so any of that is is very is you know attachment to any of it is going to be suffering because being sensitive is irritating it's a, you can't just have pleasurable sensations in the sensitivity and Uh, always means both pleasure and pain birth you has it can't just be born and get younger and younger <laughs> that'd be an interesting one wouldn't it <laughs> you go back to being an egg <laughs> or it, <laughs> or you grow up wouldn't it be nice if you could be born reach the peak of youthful beauty what age would that be 25 something like that and just stay there forever <laughs> no that you can't do that you got to you got the peak moments are not sustainable in life you know the best uh, is not a sustainable uh, proposition peak moments they reach their peak it's like your inhalation you can't just inhale can you you got to inhale and then it reaches a peak where you can't do it anymore and then it conditions the exhalation well that pattern is is the is the pattern of condition phenomena it's all works on that same principle arising and ceasing so the awareness of arising and ceasing the reflection on arising and ceasing that is not arising and ceasing that is a that is what is sustainable is awareness awareness once you recognize it and cultivate it it's it's self sustaining you don't have you don't create it and it's not dependent on conditions supporting uh awareness awareness is 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 uh, is not <coughs> uh obstructed by the conditions that we have to experience so then ordinariness is um isn't recognized and that's where in in this retreat uh rather than seeking extremes of blissful states and and getting high on tranquility it really really open to to the the uh, conditions you're experiencing through the pain to the to the doubt to the frustration to to the difficulties and and uh, whatever you know you're having during this retreat see it as opportunity rather than as something to Uh, drive away or get rid of 
No, it's like I, I developed a, a practice of welcoming because I'm, uh, I'm, you know, before I was very much controlling and there's so much effort in trying to get rid of things I don't like. Mental, mental conditions, certain thoughts and memories and, and emotions that I don't like in me at all and spent most of my life uh, ignoring or trying to get rid of or just reacting to by denying or avoiding, resisting. So I, I developed welcoming. You know, these negative unwanted states start impinging on consciousness. Say, Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, if, if you really mean it, you know, you really, you know, if, if you're using it in order to get rid of it, it, it doesn't work. But <laughs> this is where you know, you have to be quite sincere in welcoming. It's not just you're not trying to fool yourself. But that that allowed me to to look at something that before I'd maybe spent most of my life avoiding or rejecting. Just like mental, uh, emotional habits and things that are, if you become so used to denying them or res- resisting them, that you don't even know you're doing it. Till you start paying attention, till you start observing, witnessing the way it is. So in many times, you know, people consider Buddhists, uh, uh, you know, that we are not facing the real world. We get monks. We get accused of this all the time. Now you're not living in the real world. <laughs> and you know, when you look at most people's lives, they're the real world. What is it? The television? The website? <laughs> Playing golf, or you know, this is this the real world, or you know, this is the thing is the monastics if they're if they're practicing dhamma are you know facing reality, and reality then is the deathless reality. It's real. It's not not abstract kind of philosophy, and that reality then. Uh, is to be recognized and to to be um, developed, cultivated. It's not that you cultivate reality, but the awareness, because of the the power of our habits, tend to always pull us back into the samsara or the the uh, the habitual patterns. So the with meditation methods and and uh, religious ceremonies and and uh, icons and whatnot these are all you know can be supportive towards awareness because they remind us you know, having a buddha rupa around you know like living in monasteries you've got buddha rupas all over the place every time you see a buddha rupa a buto awakened attention so you know you see them in this way, then you've got always these these uh, helpful objects to to remind because it's so easy to forget and get carried away with the problems of the world. Because in monasteries you always have problems too. You don't avoid problems by becoming a monk or a nun. But you but the we can always create problems around everything. <laughs> Monks are really good at creating problems around the most trivial things. <laughs> you should go to a Sangha meeting in Thailand sometime. And uh, these, uh, these can get quite heated. You know, quite strong feelings about whether Monks, proper monks keeping the vineyard can use perfume soap. (laughs) (laughs) 
or whether we shouldn't. <laughs> so these are <laughs> but then they look at the Buddha, then awareness of this. You know, the, the way awareness of, of, you know, one's own view. You know, those that, you know, you might have a preference. You think you're very, you're kind of very purist kind of monk. You think, no perfume soap allowed in this monastery. You have to get only ivory soap <laughs> or life boy or... <laughs> No lux soap allowed, you know. and you know, get very dogmatic. And then others say it doesn't really matter, you know. Uh, soap is soap. But you know, when you start listening to your own opinion, suddenly it's not like you know, you know what you're not going to to create problems around soap. At least I'm not. <laughs> but I still, you know, easily inclined towards preferences. So, and to see that, you know, how, you know, we all have certain inclinations uh, and, and tendencies uh, on the personal level, on the conditional level. But these are not, no longer grasped. And, and made into issues and causes for bad feeling and and accusation and division of, in the sangha. Because the aim, you know, the aim of of the monastic discipline is for awareness, not for you know ultimate refinement of discipline or or you know using discipline as a as an ascetic practice. It's for awareness, for awakened attention to the present. So uh, I'll stop here, offer this as a reflection for this evening. Uh, finish the evening with the sharing of blessings which is on page 26 we'll do the English English version actually page 27 Now let us chant the verses of sharing and aspiration. Through the goodness that arises from my practice, may my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world. May the highest gods and evil forces, celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of death, may those who are friendly, indifferent or hostile, May all beings receive the blessings of my life. May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless. Through the goodness that arises from my practice and through this act of sharing, May all desires and attachments quickly cease, and all humble states of mind 
until I realize Nibbana in every kind of birth. May I have an upright mind with mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. May the forces of delusion not take hold, nor weaken my resolve. The Buddha is my excellent refuge, and the past is the protection of the Dharma. The solitary Buddha is my noble Lord. The Sangha is my supreme support. Through the supreme power of all these, may darkness and delusion be dispelled. The perfectly enlightened and blessed one, I render homage to the Buddha, the blessed one. The teaching so completely explained by him, I bow to the Dhamma. Blessed one's disciples who have practiced well, I bow to the sun.